My name is Mary Ann Tawa, and I'm a nurse practitioner in dermatology and cutaneous oncology, and I practice at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm going to speak to you today about clinical trials and the nursing perspective. The role of clinical research nurse is multidimensional. Uh, the clinical research nurse works in collaboration with a physician, is responsible for design, implementation, and evaluation of clinical research in their specific program or area. So in our disease, um, it would be within the Cutaneous Oncology Disease Center. The clinical research nurse possesses expert knowledge of cancer as a disease process, cancer treatment modalities, and the process of conducting medical clinical research. The clinical research nurse utilizes evidence-based nursing practice and has expertise in developing and coordinating a plan of care designed to meet the physical, psychological, and social needs of those patients and their families undergoing therapy in a clinical trial arena. The responsibilities of a clinical research nurse are multidimensional. They range from administrative to clinical, the actual conducting of the research, and then behind the scenes professional development. Um, the administrative functions include everything from assisting with developing the protocol, coming up with the ideas, bringing them forth to the Investigational Review Board or the IRB, working on the process, figuring out the budget preparation, how much uh, various facets of the trial are going to cost um, the, the setting or the patient. The uh, other administrative functions include an interface with the NCI or the National Cancer Institute, um, industry, if industry such as the pharma pharmaceutical industry um, being involved in the trial, and other national cooperative groups. The research responsibilities include everything from recruitment of patients into the trial and assisting with registering them. So in the course of caring for patients, really thinking about those that might fit the profile of the trial, coordinating their schedule for, their various, for the uh, various labs, um, clinic visits, uh, radiography or x-rays or imaging studies that are uh, uh, inherent to the trial, monitoring results as they come in. So as blood levels come in, taking a look at that data and informing um, uh, the uh, investigators of, of that information. Collaborating within and outside the institution. The clinical responsibilities involve everything from coordinating the study enrollment and the protocol uh, therapy, um, educating the patient on the elements of the trial, what's involved in the trial, what their responsibilities are in the trial, performing the education outside of um, the patient setting. So when there are uh, infusion um, nurses involved in delivering an agent to a patient, educating them on um, the nuts and bolts of the trial. Uh, monitoring the environment of care, which is absolutely imperative to make sure that safety is ensured throughout the course of the patient's participation in a trial. And then once again, behind the scenes, the professional development. The uh, research nurse is responsible for membership to their national organizations, uh, working on manuscripts, um, articles, and presentations re um, relating to either the disease process or the elements of the clinical trial and the outcomes of the trial, maintaining his or her professional licensure and certification, and uh, once again, uh, bringing lots of experience to the mix. So the first question that patients are going to ask about uh, is, you know, what are clinical trials? And by definition, a clinical trial is patient-based research to um, address an unsolved clinical problem. And when patients have concerns about, um, you know, the safety environment, um, the important thing that patients need to be aware of is that clinical trials are highly supervised from an ethical perspective, a scientific perspective, and um, maintenance of a clinical standard perspective. Uh, when patients are taking a look at a protocol um, and a consent form for a clinical trial, one of the important questions is, what phase of clinical trial is being conducted here? What am I being asked to participate in? So the answer to that question is they're conducted according to four levels of complexity. By and large, most um, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma studies are not phase one clinical trials. As you can see here, um, they're 
typically a smaller number of patients that are recruited into phase one trials. Um, they're usually sort of the first experience of that, uh, that agent in man. Um, once again, looking at how is that agent metabolized? What is a proper dose and dose um, in regards to producing effect and dose in response uh, to toxicity? A phase two trial tends to um, involve a larger number of patients. Uh, we have here 30 to 90 patients. And you're looking at response rate. Um, and uh, once again, the quality of the response and the duration of response. And many of the clinical trials in the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma patients would be phase two trials. Phase three trials are an even larger number uh, population of patients. And that's once again taking a look at effects on survival and comparing um, our agent, the study agent, to what's already out there and approved in the marketplace. And that's where a drug um, sort of resides before it goes to approval by the FDA. And then phase four trials are sort of the post-marketing. What has happened months to years down the road once the drug has been approved? An important concept with clinical trials, of course, is um, taking into consideration they're very expensive on many ends. So clinical trials in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, you know, where does nursing fit in? Many patients will um, question uh, what is going to happen with the relationship that they've um, forged with um, uh, the nurse in their practice if they move to a clinical trial. So they ask that question, will I be seeing you during the course of uh, the clinical trial, or will a new relationship with a new nurse with new perspective need to, um, uh, to be added to the repertoire? Um, and um, for many patients, their concern is, will my perspective on cutaneous T-cell lymphoma get lost? So the history that they have shared with the practice when they move into a clinical trial arena um, the new providers within the, um, the scope of the clinical trial will need to understand the patient and their disease and their symptom complex associated with the disease. So an important sort of reality of um, clinical trial is, um, and I need to ask this question, and the patient needs to ask this question, and the, the, the primary investigators on a clinical trial need to ask this question, is there something importantly scientific that's going to occur in the course of a clinical trial? We need to sort of consider that when we make a decision whether or not we want to participate. And um, how will I be protected in the course of a clinical trial? And we'll get into that in a moment. So for patients, um, I usually suggest, you know, take a look at yourself and where you fit in with the study group that they're proposing for the clinical trial. So do I sort of fit in with the others that are going to be looked at and enrolled in um, this clinical trial? So do I meet the study requirements either by age, by gender, by the variant of my disease, by the stage of my disease? Do I fit into the group? And the whole notion of clinical risk versus benefit. Am I somebody who's willing to take a risk with um, a new clinical agent? And um, am I uh, willing to take that risk with the opportunity to have benefit? And, you know, with the whole idea that the new therapy potentially is going to teach us something and uh, offer us something su superior to what is considered standard therapy. The whole safety environment with clinical trials is a big question for patients. And, um, you know, that's one of the questions that clinical trials ask is uh, identifying a side effect that might, might occur with an agent. When does it occur in the course of a clinical trial and how would it be managed? Um, depending on the phase of a trial, it's not always known. And the unknown is oftentimes difficult for patients. The major question that patients have about the whole safety environment, and for some patients, this is something that they're willing uh, to embark on. And for others, it may not be for you, but more frequent um, visits and phys physical exams, more frequent blood tests, more fre frequent imaging studies, and oftentimes more frequent biopsies and photographs. And for some patients that works and others not. So when you sit down and have um, a discussion with your uh, dermatologist or oncologist or the clinical trial team, there's sort of questions you need to ask yourself and ask them. Are we answering questions about the cancer cell with my clinical trial participation? Is that why tissue samples are going to be procured? Is that why laboratory work is going to be obtained? Um, are we looking at drug development? Are we looking at a new agent and bringing that agent to market, oftentimes in a more accelerated fashion? And realize that there's oftentimes overlap between the two, which is a good thing. And that's sort of the whole notion of translational research. 
So as one sits down with a clinical trial team, I, I, you know, I think about the perspective of the healthcare provider who's describing the trial and the patient who's sitting there be, becoming the recipient of the information about that trial, what they're thinking and what the provider is thinking. So it becomes a provider's responsibility to decipher for the patient and describe for the patient, is this a phase one trial? phase two trial or phase three, and how, how that happens to be. It's very important that the investigator on the trial obtain informed consent so the patient really knows what they're signing up for, what their responsibilities and duties are when they take, when they take part in the trial. And it's important for the healthcare provider, whether it be the dermatologist, the oncologist, and or other physicians involved, um, to describe the power of the trial. Will your participation, will participation in patients throughout the world um, uh, increase the power or the p-value of the trial. The patients, on the other hand, are asking the question, you know, if I get randomized, am I going to get randomized to a placebo arm? The good news on most CTCL trials is there is not a placebo arm. There's usually standard therapy arms. So for the patient, they need to, you know, it's a gamble. It's a risk. Am I going to get randomized to this important, new, interested, tailored, targeted drug that may make its way into the uh, approval pipeline? Or am I going to get standard therapy that perhaps I've heard about, read about, didn't always think it was for me? So it's a risk involved. Um, what happens when the risks outweigh the benefits as I'm experiencing side effects? How will that be managed? Do I remain in the trial? Can I withdraw from the trial? All those sort of questions need to be answered. And you need to ask the question, will my visits be more frequent? Because for a lot of patients, that will work. And for other patients, it's geographically difficult and challenging. And where does my insurance fit in? Does my insurance participate in the clinical trial at all? Or are all these visits covered on another realm? So when patients are performing their decision making about whether or not clinical trial enrollment is for them, I always suggest you bring a second set of ears, somebody to take notes and provide prompts when you need to ask questions that perhaps you've forgotten, and to write down all of the study team's answers so that when you go back and think about whether or not the clinical trial is for you and you do some more reading, you can synthesize that data. So the decision making that should take place when um, a patient is considering a clinical trial, A, bring a second set of ears to the meeting, bring somebody with you that you trust, that's perhaps done some reading about uh, the trial with you, um, that can prompt you when needed uh, to ask additional questions and can assist you with writing down the study team's answers. Um, a lot of work goes um, on behind the scenes um, after a visit to discuss a clinical trial where this information gets synthesized and processed at home and helps you make your decision about whether or not enrollment is for you. Um, it's important when you have a clinical trial visit, when you're information gathering, to figure out whether or not a clinical trial is for you. And that decision making may um, come based on whether or not the procedures associated with that clinical trial are for you. Oftentimes, more frequent blood work is um, expected of the patient at different points in time, particularly early on in a clinical trial, it may be very frequent blood tests. More skin biopsies may be obtained over time. Photo documentation of your, of your skin throughout the course of uh, your clinical trial. And more frequent uh, radiographs or imaging studies, such as CAT scans or PET scans, may be performed. Um, where else can you get information when you're getting to the point where you're trying to figure out whether or not you want to participate in a trial, to become enrolled in a trial, would be speaking with your primary care provider, speaking with your dermatologist and or your oncologist, get asking more questions of the study team, getting second opinions, and then going to some of the support groups um, that are out there, such as the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, the National um, uh, Cancer Institute, or perhaps the setting in which your clinical trial is being conducted, the hospital itself may very well have very good resources. And for many patients, their financial concerns are, are great when participating in a clinical trial. And there are services within the context of many clinical trials where financial discussions can be had. 
So navigation and guidance with cutaneous uh, T-cell lymphoma trials. Um, you know, patients need to figure out where does the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma trial fit into the schematic of what is considered traditional, accepted, sort of standard care um, ver versus skin-directed skin and systemic therapy. So where does the trial fit in? Is it for early stage patients who are receiving skin-directed care, or is it for later stage patients who have more systemic therapies um, um, under their belt? So where do I fit in? Where does this study drug fit in? That's an important question. Do other treatments that I've had in the past that perhaps I've tried and failed with have any predictive value for whether or not this study drug's gonna work for me? Once again, a question to be asked, something to be pondered. And, um, you know, ask the question is, is this clinical trial intended to postpone or prevent further aggressive therapies? Am I being recommended for this trial? Am I pursuing this trial because it's going to postpone more significant, more aggressive therapies for me in the future? And for a lot of patients, there's that whole level of concern about letting go of therapies that have been tried and true over time and making their way uh, to um, an area that's somewhat considered to be uh, the unexpected and unknown. So questions also for patients to concern, um, concern themselves with and ask when they're embarking on clinical trials is, will I continue with my same providers or am I going to be relegated to a new study group of providers? Oftentimes that's a very good thing, but for some patients that's difficult to let go of. So asking who I will see in the course of the clinical trial, um, because the usual ways that one would have managed their symptom or their disease will change a bit when you're in the setting of a clinical trial. So the usual way you describe your disease, you may be asked to learn a new language, to grade yourself in a different way, to, to maintain diaries in the course of a clinical trial. And, you know, success or not, ask the question, if this agent is working for me and I am participating in this trial, what happens when the study ends? Will I be able to receive this agent on an ongoing basis or will the drug be withdrawn from me? Most often in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma trials, if the, if the trial ends, the patient is able to receive that agent in an ongoing fashion, provided they have responded on a compassionate basis. And then what happens when I withdraw? What happens if a patient experiences a side effect profile that's too cumbersome, too difficult, or it's just too much of a commitment to be involved in the trial? Where do I go from there? Do I return to my CTCL providers at that institution? What happens to me? An important question for patients to ask. Always you know, take into consideration the logistics of participating in a trial. Where do I live in relationship to the study center? Can I get there in a reasonable fashion? Will my work support me while I enroll, uh, um, enroll in a cl clinical trial? Will my family support me while I'm involved in a clinical trial? And once again, um, you know, the whole notion of a comfort level with receiving treatment where the benefits are sometimes not known, where I couldn't have read about how other patients have done with this drug because they haven't been exposed. I can't go to the listserv and find out how it's worked for other patients. And then once again, employment concerns and costs. Ask those questions. Is my insurance going to get involved in this clinical trial? Many of the trials, the drugs are covered by the industry that supports the trial, but there may be times and certain studies that are involved in the trial that are considered clinical care that would be covered by your insurer. So ask those questions. And where am I going to get my support? Where am I going to get my support when I'm making my decision as well as when I'm enrolled? So some of the important places that I suggest that patients take a look for the purpose of investigating clinical trials would be the NCI or the National Cancer Institute, the National uh, uh, Library of Medicine's list of clinical trials, and of course the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation.